We now come to a part of today's program that is relatively rare in the life of the university. San Jose State University has bestowed only 21 honorary degrees since 1963, the first year in which honorary degrees were granted by the California State University system. The Board of Trustees of the California State University has approved our 22nd honorary doctorate to Mr. Steven Lopez for his exemplary achievements as a journalist and an author who has chronicled the news, events, and people of Southern California for the last de decade. Trustee Robert Linscheid will, will represent the California State University Board of Trustees in conferring the honorary degree. Trustee Linscheid, would you join me? Thank you, President Cassie. It is indeed an honor for me to be here this evening. You see, honorary degrees, as President Cassing mentioned, have occurred in this system since 1963. The first on June 6, 1963, to then John F. Kennedy. Clearly, an award and recognition that we take very seriously. So honorary degrees are confirmed by the Board of Trustees through a highly selective process in order to recognize excellence and extraordinary achievement in significant areas of human endeavor. Nominees must be distinguished in their fields and must have demonstrated intellectual and humane values that are consistent with the aims of higher education and the highest levels of, of a person's chosen field. On behalf of the California State University Board of Trustees, I hereby certify that the appropriate procedure has been followed in the nomination of this candidate by the California State University, San Jose State University, and the Board of Trustees. Mr. Stephen Lopez, would you please join the President and myself at the podium, please. On behalf of the California State University and San Jose State University, it is an honor for me to read this citation. To, CS, to CSU San Jose's alumni and Pittsburgh native, Steve Lopez. Stephen M. Lopez is best known for a series of columns and a book about his unlikely friendship with a homeless, mentally ill musician. His book, The Soloist, inspired a 2009 film of the same name. But Mr. Lopez is also an extraordinary journalist who has chronicled the news, events, and people of Southern California for the last decade and has become a powerful voice for the role of journalism in addressing societal issues. Mr. Lopez joined the staff of the Los Angeles Times in May of 2001 after four years at Time Incorporated where he wrote for Time, Sports Illustrated, Life, and Entertainment Weekly. Prior to Time Incorporated, Mr. Lopez was columnist at the Philadelphia Inquirer, the San Jose Mercury News, and the Oakland Tribune. He is also an author of three novels and a book of nonfiction. His work has won numerous national journalism awards for column writing and magazine reporting, including 2009 Penn Awards for creative nonfiction. During a time when journalism is changing, Lopez's body of work has helped to build connections among individuals and communities. His work embodies the ideals of both the California State University and San Jose State University. In recognition of his contribution to the field of journalism and is dedicated to building awareness about homelessness and mental, and mental illness, the Board of Trustees of the California State University and San Jose State University are proud to confer upon Stephen M. Lopez the honorary degree of Doctor of Humane Letters.
President Cassian, will you now confer upon author and columnist Steve Lopez the honorary degree? By the authority vested in me, I confer upon Stephen Lopez the degree of Doctor of Humane Letters with all of the rights, honors, and opportunities appertaining thereto. It is an ancient custom to invest those who receive academic degrees with hoods that des designate the degree conferred. I now ask Trustee Lynchide to present the hood to Stephen Lopez. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it is my distinct pleasure to present our keynote speaker for this evening, Dr. Stephen Lopez. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Congratulations, students. Congratulations, parents. I just got some terrible news backstage. They said you can't keep the cap or the gown. <laughs> I said I have to give this back. I saw myself out on the town tonight in this getup. <laughs> I could have gotten into the royal wedding with this, don't you think? <laughs> now, I have to admit that I wasn't so sure what to make of it when I was notified that I'd be getting an honorary doctorate because of the word honorary. And I thought, you know, if they're giving these things to the likes of me, the honor will forever be diminished for future recipients. But then I thought, you know, what the heck? Why not just go with it? I told all of my colleagues at the LA Times, within 10, 20, 30 feet of me, that from here on out, they are looking at Dr. Lopez. I liked, right away, right away, I liked the sound of it. I started making restaurant reservations as <laughs> Dr. Lopez. My wife had something to say. I'm sorry, can you call my office in two weeks and make an appointment? <laughs> I mean, this could really work for me. Um, but all kidding aside, I thought, you know, this is, Without a doubt, the only way I'm ever going to get a doctorate. So why don't I just take the thing? It's a chance to go back to San Jose State. And more specifically, and more importantly, a chance to pay tribute, not just to this great university, but to this great state university system in California. This system and this school have launched so many scholars, so many doctors, so many educators. This is one of the great institutions in the history of this state. And I want to tell you that I didn't have the money to come here out of high school and then a community college. And I want to, as people pay tribute to the parents who got you through this, tonight pay tribute to my parents who got me into this school and paid the bills. They're sitting, <laughs> Grace and Tony Lopez are sitting in the front row there with the rest of my family.
And mom and dad, I want to thank you. It wasn't easy for them to come up with the money to send a son to college. I helped out when I could, but they knew that this was important to me, and they, like so many parents, wanted to give their son a shot at a better life than what they had. Also tonight here, I want to acknowledge my sister Deb, my cousins are here, Larry and Rick, and Linda, a San Jose State alum, and my wife Allison and daughter Caroline. And you folks here are in luck tonight um, because my daughter, who's just seven, will be squirming a little bit. And when the squirming gets to a certain level, I'll know that we've got to leave. Um, and so we're only a few minutes off from that. Um, and when I do leave, don't take this personally, I'm racing off the stage and out the door because they're not getting this cap or this gown. <laughs> so I'm thinking back on San Jose State. I'm thinking on one of the first courses that I took. I'm thinking about these great opportunities. I'm wondering why, I'm wondering why such a great institution in the year 2011 is being dismantled. What's great about this system is that it takes all comers. The neighborhood you come from doesn't matter. The income level doesn't matter. And people come from neighborhoods across the state. They come from countries around the world. This has been the engine, the engine that has driven the California economy. This is what made California the fifth or sixth or seventh largest economy in the world. It was this great public education and state university system. It was a national model. It made us proud. It gave people like me, who might not have gotten into more expensive schools, a shot to make a mark. And it's being dismantled. And I implore those of you going into public policy and to politics to find the fixes. And what's really frustrating is that the fixes are not mysteries. We can do this. What's more important than sending out the employees of the future economy of this state? And people say, yes, but how can we afford to keep paying all of those professors? And how can we afford to keep doing all of this, and what we have to ask ourselves, our neighbors in Sacramento is, how can California afford not to support great institutions? <laughs> like San Jose State. And I won't, because I'll get into trouble and possibly scare away potential donors, I won't talk about what those fixes are. Some of them are painful, but it can be done. And this is something that must be preserved. And I remember in one of my first classes at San Jose State with the legendary Dwight Bentel. Let's hear it, Journalism School, for Dwight Bentel, who is 102 years old. <clears throat> and Dwight Bentel, on the first day of a class on media and law, told a story about what reporters going out into the world needed to know. And the story was about Scrappy Squadrito. They're already chuckling over there in the journalism department. Scrappy Squadrito scored a coup, ladies and gentlemen. He was working for the Spartan Daily, and he managed, when the San Jose State Spartan football team went to Hawaii to play in a football game, to get a seat on that plane. And he arrives in Hawaii, the Spartan Daily's man on the scene. And it's, did I say, 1941? And the bombs start falling on Pearl Harbor. And Dwight Bentel is horrified, of course, but thinks our timing couldn't have been better. The Spartan Daily has a man on the scene of one of the greatest, greatest stories of the century. Scrappy Squadrito.
and Dwight's trying to get through to him, and he's waiting for the dispatches. Those stories have got to be coming through. The Spartan Daily has a man on the scene. We'll live in infamy. And there's no call from Scrappy and no way to get through from him and no dispatches. And this goes on for days. And finally, the team returns, and Bentel runs up to him, and Scrappy, he says, Scrappy, what the heck, Scrappy, where's the story? Where's the story? And Scrappy says, oh, there is no story. The game was canceled. <laughs> I have been waiting so long to say, tell you that story <laughs> from a stage. I'm tempted, I really am tempted to tell it again. Um, his point was, keep your eyes open, young reporters. Keep your eyes and ears open. I got such great tools in the journalism school. I worked for that Spartan Daily as if it were a professional job. I loved it, and I had great, great teachers, Larry Snipes and Roger Budrow and many others. And we took on the Merck News. We thought that we were better than they were, and maybe we weren't, but we wanted to believe so. It was a great, great time serving this university and running around chasing stories. And the tools that I picked up here, I've carried with me. And six years ago, I'm walking through downtown Los Angeles, remembering Dwight Bentel, you never forget. I mean, that will echo in my head forever. Scrappy, where's the story? Keep your eyes and ears open. Don't miss the obvious. I hear music and I turn and here's a striking image. A man playing a violin that's missing two strings. And I look at him and the music is pretty good and I'm thinking, how is that possible? And I look a little closer and I realize that he's not playing for money. He's playing his heart out as if it's a practice session. And I move in closer and he's got a little sign on the side of a shopping cart and it's clear that he's living out of the shopping cart. And it says on that sign, Little Walt Disney Concert Hall. And the big Walt Disney Concert Hall, the home of the Los Angeles Philharmonic, is a few blocks away. And I'm thinking, what an inspiration. But what is this guy's story? And I introduce myself, and he's terrified, and he jumps back, and I say, when he calms down, I'm with the LA Times. I'm interested in learning about how you learn to play so well on two strings. And I'm also curious as to why you play in this spot. And he said, I play in this spot because there's the Beethoven statue. I play here for inspiration. I said, are you aware that a violin has four strings? And he said, my whole goal in life is to figure out how to get the other two. And I said, where'd you learn how to play? And he said, it was a long time ago. I'm just trying to get back on track. And so I begin visiting him, and the story comes out in bits and pieces. And one day, he's scratching names on the sidewalk. And I say, who are they, Rebecca? and Mary, Stephen and Thomas, and Mr. Nathaniel Anthony Ayers looks at me and says, oh, nobody, those were my students at Juilliard. I said, excuse me, Mr. Ayers, you went to the Juilliard School for the Performing Arts in New York City? He says, it was a long time ago, just trying to get back on track. And the story is that in his third year, he began to see and hear things that nobody else did. He didn't know who to tell or what to say, he had a breakdown, was diagnosed with schizophrenia, went home to Cleveland, and when his mother died, took a bus to Los Angeles, not knowing what to do or where to go, found the Beethoven statue, and was trying to resurrect his career. And I meet this man, and I write this story, and readers saw that it was a there but for the grace of God story. They saw that it was a story of second chances. They wanted to help. They were rooting for me, rooting for him, they wanted to see him get back to the music. And here's this man playing with all his heart 35 years after going off a cliff, playing as if it were possible to still reach that dream. And when he played, the look on his face, it was ecstasy. And I started thinking about things like, well, I guess you would think what an unfortunate soul, but this man has what all of us are looking for. He knows what he lives for. He's got purpose. He's got passion. And he gets up and he fights through those demons. And he still sees and hears things that we don't. And he reaches as his world spins out of control. 
he reaches for the sheet music and when he sees that the notes haven't moved in 200 years, they're right where Beethoven left them. He's home, he's safe, he's sane. He's as happy as any of us can ever expect to be. This man became an inspiration to me and he's living on the streets and one night I went out with him worried that all of the instruments donated to him by readers might attract a mugging. And we're on Skid Row, home to thousands of people like Nathaniel, home to thousands of people, many of them home from combat, Vietnam, Afghanistan, and Iraq, dealing with post-traumatic stress disorder, dealing with traumatic brain injury, and we look at them and write them off and think they've made a moral decision to be out there. And maybe they're sipping from the bottle and we write them off and we don't know the terrors they're escaping, and we don't understand that it's self-medication. And here's Mr. Ayers out there with thousands of people like that in this place that we have created. We shut down mental hospitals and never followed through on the promise of community clinics. We built Skid Row. And Nathaniel Anthony Ayers is crushing cockroaches with his heel and kicking them into the gutter to clear a space for his bedding. And he looks up into lighted rooms and says, you know, Mr. Lopez, Beethoven and Mozart once worked through the night in rooms like those. They lived and breathed as humans do, and they created something that lasted for centuries. Are you inspired by that, Mr. Lopez? He stepped to the curb and in a perfect Shakespearean accent recited the Hamlet soliloquy. And I said, Mr. Ayers, where'd that come from? And he said, John Hay High School, University Circle, Cleveland, Ohio. We took a few acting classes. And I said, 35 years later, you remember the Hamlet soliloquy? And he said, it was Shakespeare, Mr. Lopez. Aren't you a writer? <laughs> Mr. Ayers took two sticks out of a shopping cart. On one, he'd written Beethoven, and on the other, he'd written Brahms. And when I asked what those were for, and he said, when the rats came out of the sewers, he tapped Beethoven and Brahms, and the rats scattered. And he went to sleep with a symphony in his head. And I went banging on doors at City Hall. And I went to Capitol Hill, where I was a keynote speaker at a congressional briefing on how to rescue the Nathaniels of the world. He's taken me places, this man living out of a shopping cart that I never thought I'd go to. Last summer, he gets invited to the White House by the Obamas. We entered separately because he was a performer. By the time I got in, Mr. Ayers is lounging on a sofa with his shoes off, like he lives there, saying, where have you been? We went from there to the Carter Center. We got back to LA and I said, I don't know how we're gonna top these things, Mr. Ayers. And he said, do you think we could go to Rome to meet with the Pope? <laughs> I'm working on that, I'm working on that. Mr. Ayers, it took a year with my support and with the work of professionals. He came in off the streets, he moved inside. And today, in that room, he has two trombones. I'm looking down into this orchestra pit here. Two trumpets. He's got a French horn. He's got a viola. He's got two cellos, six violins, a piano, electric keyboards, percussion. And he just decides each day what he wants to play. And it rescues him from those demons that still torment him. He's my friend. And what I've learned from him, what I've learned from him is what life is about and what all of you must now search for as you go out into the world. It's about finding your purpose. One day, Mr. Ayers had on a t-shirt, Yo Yo Ma, and I said, what's up? And he said, he's coming to town, can you get us tickets? And I said, I thought you only liked the dead guys. And he said, well, I'm just curious as to how the youngster looks these days. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, I haven't seen him since we played together. I said, excuse me, Mr. Ayers? You played with Yo Yo Ma? He said, yeah, we were in the same orchestra at Juilliard. We went to see Yo-Yo Ma at Disney Hall. We had a little reunion when it was over. Yo-Yo Ma walks into the room and nobody knows what to say. And Yo-Yo Ma walks over, shakes his hand and says, I know you love Beethoven. I've been reading all about you. Anybody who loves Beethoven that much is a friend of mine. And they shake hands, there's silence. And then Yo-Yo Ma reaches up, gives him a big bear hug and says, Nathaniel, you and I are brothers. We're brothers in music. He steps back and hands Nathaniel his cello and says, I've got to meet some friends, fiddle with this. I'll be back in a while. 
And Yo-Yo Ma leaves and there's silence and Nathaniel looks at me and says, that, Mr. Lopez, Mr. Lopez, that was Yo-Yo Ma. <laughs> and I said, I'm aware of that. I'm aware of that, Mr. Ayers. And he said, no, but that was Yo-Yo Ma. And I'm thinking about these two guys launched from the same stage at the same time, going into different orbits, completely different orbits. But who's really accomplished more? Yo-Yo Ma gets no more pleasure out of that cello than Nathaniel Anthony Ayers does. And I started to realize that he had me thinking about the true definition of success, of passion, of purpose. And he hit me at a time when I was thinking of moving on from journalism. And then Mr. Ayers taught me this, that I had my own passion and it was telling stories and that I couldn't walk away from that, that I'm on a mission just as he is. As you go out, please look past generalizations and stereotypes. You don't know who it is who might influence you, inspire you, change your life. Please remember, too, what a great privilege it is to walk away from here with a degree from a great university. Don't forget to give back. What I've learned from Mr. Ayers is that there's grace in giving. People like to congratulate me for all that I've done for him. And I have to tell them that he's done more for me. Congratulations to all of you. May you enter this world with a sense of purpose and mission and humility. Are there journalism honor, honorees in the, uh, in the audience? I'd like to say my final words to them. Number one, as you go out there, make San Jose State University proud. Number two, whoever you're going after, give them hell. <laughs> and number three, please, 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 do not try to take my job. <laughs> Thank you.